Um, I'm really excited to be here. I was telling Desmond, I have actually imagined this conversation for over two years. With Desmond, I follow him, I know it seems a bit stalkerish, I get it. Um, but I follow him very closely and I do a different kind of work with, I hope, a similar spirit. Um, so I have, you know, when you're doing that and you're seeing somebody in a different world, you have questions about like, what is it like on your side of the fence and what is going on uh, in your personal life too. So we've heard a lot about your politics and I really want to get into like you and your story and have a um, the, the personal side of what we see on social media and what we see in the news so that when we're writing these letters and doing these things, it's with our friend Desmond in mind not just the activist Desmond. Um, for a lot of us, you came on the scene with the Toronto Life article. Um, that made a big difference, a big splash. It's where people may have heard your name for the first time. Um, and I wonder if for you, was that the beginning? Was that the start of something? Or had you been sending out sort of flares of attention before then, and that was the first one to make a big landing? Um. So, I started writing for publications anyway yeah. in 2010, and it was never really what I thought I was going to be doing, and um, it was about as financially lucrative then as it is now, which is to say not at all. Um, so, yeah, the comment of, about uh, being a professional. I, I certainly am not a professional journalist because I don't have a full-time job in journalism and I never have. And um, in 2010, I just started writing for Torontoist, for an online publication that was interested in a piece that I had written about police officers being in our schools. And I'm very happy to say that at least in the Toronto District School Board, we got a decision last year to remove all the police from Toronto schools, and I think that's excellent. <laughs> community literally had to fight for 10 years. That summer was the G20. I went to the G20 to observe. I had no real plan to go right there. And I saw what was going on in downtown Toronto. And I saw the hundreds, which became thousands of people getting arrested. And I was like, I've got to write about this. I was just shocked. And I started really getting um, quite a sense of purpose and fulfillment from covering the news. So that's what I started doing, and I always had different jobs. So I was working in a coffee shop, yeah. right? I worked as kind of a, um, it was kind of like a glorified office manager for the Center for Social Innovation. They had a really cool title for me, they called me a community animator. <laughs> um, it means that you make sure there's coffee. <laughs> uh, I did a lot more, I'm kind of joking, but uh, yeah. Uh, and all the while that I was doing these things, I had one eye on the news and one eye on what's my next piece gonna be. <clears throat> and so before people kind of read that Toronto Life piece, I was out here. I had been covering the police services board. I had written my first piece about carding like three years before I wrote the, the skin I'm in for Toronto Life. And so sometimes people see you pop onto a scene and they think you're new and they don't realize how much investment I had to put in to going to meetings, to reading documents, to talking to public officials before I could really feel confident to write. And the piece with, with Toronto Life, when you did it, how did that even come about? Because I know when, um, when you're in the journalist room and you're, you're breaking down stories, that sometimes those are the very stories that people don't want to talk about. And so I'm curious how that story idea came about and how like you, you landed on the cover. That was wild. <laughs> that was like none of it. So one thing about writing is that writing often takes a life of its own. I know you know this. And um, that's how it was with this piece. So in December or so of 2014, I had just come back from Ferguson, Missouri. I went to Ferguson after the decision not to charge uh, Darren Wilson, the police officer who murdered Mike Brown in Ferguson. The day after that decision was taken, I went to Ferguson. 
and I reported from there for a week for Walrus Magazine. And not a lot of Canadians went down there to do reporting. So it was a very new uh, kind of experience for me to have all of these big news outlets calling me, do you want to do a TV spot for free? <laughs> they don't tell you for free, and then you know, you're know you a freelancer, and you're like, you're gonna put me on TV? So you just do it. You don't realize that you can be like, yeah, how much? Um, and it was very exciting, and I came back from that, and I think um, that had really helped build my exposure with a lot of people. Toronto Life actually said, no one's written a feature in a long time in Toronto about black experiences for like a major publication. We saw your work in Ferguson. We think you would be good for this. And I was very excited. So what I actually did to start writing this piece was I started doing interviews with black people in the city that I admire, whose work I've become familiar with and that I, I really like what they do. And I, I was gonna try and do this like cross section of black Toronto that I really admire. And uh, I gave them my first draft. And honestly, like she was compassionate, but my editor basically was like, this is terrible. <laughs> um, but you told a lot of interesting little anecdotes about yourself and how you connect to being black in this city and in this region. And those were interesting and I want to hear more of those. Why don't you go back and like try to develop some of these stories a little bit more? That's how that piece was evolved. I had no intention of writing about myself. I had no intention of writing about my family and like having to tell family stories. You know that when you do a story like that, the editor has to fact check you. So my family members had to be called and asked about really difficult, embarrassing, um, personal stories to say this really happened, right? And ask questions about it. And I didn't want to do that to them, but that's what ended up happening. Um, friends that I was with when I would be stopped and humiliated by the police had to be called and said, this really happened, right? This is what our industry, like this is what our responsibility is when we're publishing things like this. So I was not prepared for any of that, Jail. And um, then the piece came out and it was just, everywhere. They didn't tell me until uh, the month before, we want to put you on the cover. And I was just like blown away when they said this to me. The photo shoot for that um, magazine, the, the pictures were very beautiful. Dude was like this, like, <laughs> right, like right up in my throat. <laughs> You know, he took like 200 pictures, like 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 literally like this close to my nose. It was a lot, um, but it was really worth it because the product in the end is photographs. Uh, uh, that was uh, Marky and, uh, and his photos were just beautiful and complemented the story in a wonderful way. And um, I have it here. You have it here. I do. Wow. I because I wanted to read one part because if you haven't read it, this is your motivation to go and read it. You say, my skin is the deep brown of a well-worn penny. My eyes are the same shade as my complexion, but they light up amber in the sun, like a glass of whiskey. On a good day, I like the way I look. At other times, particularly when people point out how dark I am, I want to slip through a crack in the ground and disappear. So that's just part of it. I can't read all of it or I will cry. <laughs> But I want to know, when you went home, you talk a little bit about what happened when it came out, but I imagine for me, when I was reading that, I thought, this is amazing, this is powerful, but whenever there's something amazing and powerful, particularly when it comes from the black community, there's resistance. And so I wonder what happened to you after that came out. Was it all good? Um, and, and, and the dark side, maybe. A lot of it was great. So much of it was great because that piece uh, was shared around the country. Uh, people in the United States read it a lot, it, it internationally even. And the validation from black people, that is still happening to this day. I still, three years later, have folks that I will run into who are black who say, I read that piece and here's what it meant to me and I 
this, it reminded me of this story of my relative, it reminded me of when I was stopped in my car, it reminded me of this. And so that, um, that level of intimacy that I now have with black people that I come into contact with where we can meet and share these stories, this is like, it's been life changing. And it's one of the most powerful things that happens to me on a regular basis that black people want to talk specifically about how they related to that piece. And that's very, very, that's the most meaningful thing as a writer when people will come and tell you, this is how this touched me. So that's been wonderful. And it's one of the greatest blessings of my life. What's not so good is when uh, police officials start calling out your name because you've been successful in telling a story and they start trying to discredit you. When trash bag white columnists in this city and in this country I am not saying they're trash because they have light colored skin, by the way, everybody. I'm pointing out the fact that because they are protected by this government and by their newsroom and by the police and by the society, they don't have a problem reading a piece like this where I was vulnerable and where I shared a very deep stuff and saying, well, I'm just gonna tear you down and attack you. Because as a white person, there's not gonna be a consequence for me to in fact, we'll say that it's plain devil's advocate. We have all these stupid terms, right? Um, that was horrible. But especially horrible was like, how are the police going to try and do something to me now that I've been affected? What's going to be the outcome? And people have very much personalized this. So they ask me personally, like, do you get treated different by the police now? And the answer is no. Uh, I have to tell people in this room, I was particularly vulnerable during a lot of the times that I was stopped by the police. Much more so, I would say, than I am now. Um, when I first came to the city of Toronto, I didn't have any money, I didn't have any job, and I didn't have a place to live permanently, like my own address, for a long time. And that was when a lot of these interactions with the police happened. I used to work at a youth drop-in center and I would get stopped around the drop-in center all the time because police just hang around the drop-in center. Homeless people are one of the police's favorite targets for carding. And that hasn't stopped either, by the way. And so they just lurk around places where they know that young people who are vulnerable go, and then they roll up on them. When the police figured out that I worked there, then they stopped. Because then they realized this person is going to mobilize something against us when we do this thing. But I've still clad people police officers come to my door and say, your music is too loud, can you turn it down? And I say, sure, no problem. And then they say, we need to see some ID. The last time that happened, lesson for everybody out here in the audience who is not black, my roommate was with me. My roommate is like 6'2", white dude, government employee, very straight guy. <laughs> He was there witnessing the police be like, you have to give us identification. So I kind of looked at him, right? And I was like, this is good, this is gonna be good. Cause I'm in my own house and I'm like, if you guys want to come in here, like I can't stop y'all, but like I felt very safe in that moment on my porch. So I said to the officer, are you sure that I have to give you my identification officer like I didn't know? And he said, yes, yes, absolutely. So I just stood there and folded my arms and I looked at my roommate and my roommate stepped forward and said, why don't you just take my information instead? Their faces were so funny because they didn't want his, they wanted mine. Because of course the noise complaint was about me. And of course when somebody has a noise complaint in the city of Toronto, you have to write their name down and put it in a police database. Right everybody? No. So, it hasn't stopped. And police don't read 5,000 word essays about anti-black racism. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just add one more thing real quick. Uh, racism does things to people's brains. One of the things that racism does is, um, so I, I, I remember the story of this young man who was telling me about his experiences getting stopped by the police. And I'll never forget what he said, because he said that the same officer used to stop him like every three or four days and ask him for all of his ID and everything. 
And after like the sixth or seventh time that this happened, the officer's like, so what's your name? And the young man was like, but how can you not know my name? They call it community policing, right? You're gonna stop somebody seven times in the span of a month or two and not know their name? That's community policing? That's what racism does though. And so even though I've been on the cover of a magazine, even though I'm on TV, these police cannot tell me from other black people, from other black men. They can't because they don't look at the features of our faces. They don't individualize us. They don't give us an identity. So it doesn't matter when you're on TV, when you're driving, when you're walking, you're just another nigger, literally. And I think one of the things that this award is about is about people who have put aside their personal interests. And this is something that um, the committee chair um, from Penn Canada's Canadian side said, putting aside personal interests to speak about racial injustice in Canada. So this article comes out, you're working for the Toronto Star, you go to this board meeting, and then we all find out, like this is what I'm watching on social media, suddenly you're not working for the Toronto Star. And so I'm curious about how that, whether that was something you were building to for a while, that that had been a stir, that you were going to step aside, or whether that's something that as this conversation rises and as you feel a sense of purpose, it becomes like an integrity issue. I, I cannot be associated with you if it means this. Like, what led to that? Yeah, it wasn't all uh, based on that one incident for sure. It had a history. Mm -hmm. um, I should remember to tell everybody in the room that I'm working on a book. I know, I'm gonna get, I will say that. I will, I will make sure. <laughs> My, my book editor is like in my ear right now. I know, so like, I know, I, just, I know. I can hear her. <laughs> so some of this will actually be documented in the book, uh, which will come out in November and you have to buy it, please. <laughs> and put it in the public library, please. Um, so when I started at the Toronto Star in September of 2015, I started there as a freelancer. And my whole year and a half writing at the Toronto Star, I was a freelancer. I never had a contract. I never had benefits. I never had a salary. What? What? Yeah. 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 They make it seem so prestigious, though, don't they? Yeah. Right? So what they're doing is keeping you in a precarious situation. You have to invoice week to week for your pieces. But when I started, they put me on the front page of the newspaper, new columnist, new weekly columnist, Desmond Cole, because they want to capitalize on my reputation and on my blackness to say, see? But they're not treating you right. They're not taking care of you. They're not paying your rent. So that was hard from the beginning. But then, about eight months after I had been writing there every week, I got a really weird message from my editor. My editor told me that a man named John Honderick, who is the chair of the board at Torstar, wanted to have lunch with me. And when your boss wants to meet with you, but when your boss's boss wants to, you're just like, this is awful, right? Like everybody is always like, this is awful. Because you're not assuming that they're meeting with you to tell you how great you are. I don't know this guy, never met him. I have no business with him. So why does he want to meet me? We go to lunch. He wines me and dines me and we talk about the raptors. <laughs> and then once he thinks that I'm warmed up enough, he comes out with it. And he starts telling me about how he's seen a lot in this world and in this business. And he's been reading my columns. And he feels like it's important for me to make sure that I diversify my topics. Because your readers want that. Your readers don't want you to be talking about the same things all the time. And race is important, but your readers want you to mix it up. I said, but they're my readers. 
they're, they're reading what I'm currently writing, so this is silly. And I'm like, this man controls your career, so be careful. Job, job. See, this is why we say job, not career. See? <laughs> controls your job. And have a career. Um, I pushed back as much as I felt I could. We went our separate ways. I actually left that meeting with him to work on a piece about Yusra Kogali of Black Lives Matter, who was under siege at the time for a tweet that she wrote, because this is what we like to do. We don't want to talk about your work, we want to talk about your tweet. That piece published the next day and was one of the most successful pieces that I wrote for the Toronto Star, and I was like, see John Hondrick, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> about three weeks later, I was demoted. So I was told, you're not gonna write weekly for us anymore, you're gonna write every other week. And I was told that the reason was because times are tough financially in the newsroom. But I'm one of your most popular writers. When I put things out, they're getting clicks, they're getting shares. I'm bringing traffic to your newspaper. I'm bringing black people to your newspaper who wouldn't read it if I wasn't there. But you're gonna cut me of all people? You just brought me on and put me on the front page celebrating me eight months ago, and I've only gotten more popular, and now you're gonna cut me in half. That's the context for me finally, in uh, spring of last year, going to a public protest, talking about the ongoing problem of carding at the police services board, raising my fist in the air. That was the part that got the way. <coughs> Always raise your fist in the air if you want uh, authority people to be upset. I don't know why this bothers them so much, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, They called me in. My editor had a piece of paper printed out when I came in, a, a set of papers. They were the uh, rules of conduct for people at the newspaper. I had never signed this, by the way, because they'd never asked me to, because they didn't want a long-term commitment with me. So he tells me that me going to a protest and doing this, he, didn't, he mentioned this part, but I don't. Um, he said that that breaks the rules of the Toronto Star. Remember, I didn't go to this protest to cover something for the Toronto Star. I was not being paid by the Toronto Star. I was writing once every other week at this point, twice a month. So you get to control what I do in my spare time? No. And this is what made it easy for me to walk away because I realized that these guys are gonna keep using you because they didn't punish me. They didn't say, next time you do this, there's gonna be this consequence or that consequence. They just wanted to say, oh, we just want you to know what the rules are. I went and I sat at home and I was very, very angry. And I called a friend of mine and I said, I'm writing my resignation. So 48 hours after I had that meeting with Andrew Phillips, I, read, I wrote my resignation. I posted it on my blog. It was retweeted over four and a half thousand times. Nothing I ever wrote for the Star was retweeted four and a half thousand times. And I have since learned that the reason that that piece where I said I was leaving was so powerful is that so many of us in our lives want to be able to do that and don't feel like we can. And I don't have any kids. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have any car payments. Um, it was a sacrifice, because then it's like, how do you pay your rent? Mm -hmm. But these people don't get my name and my credibility if they're not gonna take care of me and if they're gonna try and stop me from doing the work outside of the Toronto Star to liberate myself and my community. The greatest irony of it all, of course, is that without the Toronto Star's work on carding going back literally like 15 or 20 years, all their investigative reporting that exposed exactly how bad by the numbers this practice is. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have had the platform that I did. Mm -hmm. I was the perfect complement to this publication. Mm -hmm. And they still wanted to try and control my black rage. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that um, I want to transition to just before we go into questions, uh, you might not know, but a little while back, I guess we were saying a year ago, the documentary? Yes. The documentary came out um, on Desmond. 
the, the man who did the documentary was Charles Officer, who had done a documentary on my father and I. My father was the first black quarterback to win the Grey Cup. Chuck Ely, if you're a football fan. Um, and so when the documentary came out, I was really excited to see Charles Officer's work again. I was really excited to see Desmond. I was expecting to see this documentary on mm, activism, and, and I did. But what I saw in that documentary, I, I was almost in tears when it was done was a really tender man who was working really hard and sometimes struggling under that work. And I wonder what you thought when you saw that documentary yourself, if it reflected what you see in the mirror, who you see, or if it showed you something you haven't seen. Um, it's a good question. So first of all, um, when the documentary premiered, we had a screening at a little gallery space and about 40 people or so came, it was lovely. But my producer actually had to come to my house in his car that day and all but, you know, drag me out of the house. I, I was really down. I was going through a lot of really dark stuff and depression. Um, and I don't know if I would have gone to that premiere if he hadn't come to me, to be honest with you. I had a great production team. Jake Yanowski at 98th Parallel, uh, Stuart Anderson, they were just wonderful. The, the crew that we worked with, the photographers, they were amazing people. Um, I hate television. <laughs> so I don't like watching myself. And I was forced to do that during this process. Like Charles only showed me the first scene before we watched it all together because I wanted to have the experience of watching it with everybody in that room the first time. It was overwhelming. Um, I think what I saw when I watched that movie was um, I saw somebody who, uh, despite his access and platform, still feels very desperate about this work. That's what I saw in myself when I watched. And I think, I think that that's accurate. I think Charles captured me accurately because I am a restless person. Um, this work makes me feel restless. I am hungry thirsty for change all the time, and it's frustrating and it's difficult. And I think that that came through. And I can't watch the scene where we go to see Rose Loku, the sister of Andrew Loku, who was shot and killed on July 5th of 2015 by the Toronto police in his apartment building. I can't watch the scene with Rose uh, without crying. And I cry in the scene and I'll tell you what you don't know about the magic of television. Because what you see is that you see the interview with us, and then you see me sitting in that car crying afterwards. I was crying in the car before I went in to see Rose. Because just thinking, we were in Regina. No one had come to see this woman, ever, whose brother was murdered like this. None of the media in this country cared that he had relatives here, that they were still grieving him. And so when we pulled up and I looked at that house, I just started bawling. I couldn't even control myself. But Rose was so beautiful and so kind. And I'm really, really glad that we met her. And I'm really, really glad that she made it into that film. And when I do screenings of that film, and this is an idea for people who might be in libraries or who might, um, who might have opportunities to screen this film. Uh, when we do it for money, so if we do it at a movie theater and we ask people for a donation, I donate those proceeds uh, to the family of Andrew because he had five kids when he was alive and no one talks about that very much either. And they don't have a dad and they need support. And they've been through so, so, so much. So I try with this work always to, to honor the families and to provide because I am lucky enough to have this platform.
And it leads me to one more question before we open it up, which is like, how are you doing now? <laughs> like now, you've been doing this for a long time, but you've been really in the public eye for the last few years, getting more public. And we see in that documentary the weight of all these stories on you. And you're getting more stories, I imagine, coming your way. You're writing this book, which I know can be cathartic, maybe. Is that? Sometimes. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you're doing now. It's very nice of you to ask. <laughs> really. Um, some of my uh, friends, some people who are very, very close in my life are here this evening. And I see you, and I want to say thank you so much for coming. I wouldn't really have survived the last while without the support of people in my life who sometimes are just like, let's have dinner, let's watch a movie, let's go out. Um, I would say I'm not doing well. I would say I'm really, really struggling, except one of the things I find about being people is that we can get used to like anything. We can learn how to adapt to stuff that's really, really hard and that's even like really wrong or really, you know, we find ways to keep going. I actually have a friend right here who every time I say, how are you doing? My friend says, I continue. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yep, that's how I feel. Um, I'm just determined to keep going. I'm so, so lucky though, Joe. Like, I, I am on this ride right now, these last couple of years especially. I had a really, really big moment yesterday, actually. It's very interesting to be in this room tonight. Because yesterday, for the first time in 10 months, I published a piece in the Toronto Star. <laughs> That was a one-off, <laughs> but um, I had to publish a piece in the Toronto Star in response to a piece that was written the day before about me. Mm. And it was very, very interesting, you know? I'm going to frame the email that I sent pitching this piece to the Toronto Star yesterday. I'll tell you why. Some of you might have read this already, and you might know a little bit of the background. But basically, there is um, an extremely devious new black organization in Canada called the Federation of Black Canadians. This group has existed for all of two months, and somehow it has the ear of the prime minister, the premier, the entire liberal cabinet. There are some very deep ethical concerns, though, about this group. For example, the immigration minister, Ahmed Hussein, his wife is on the steering committee of this lobby group. We've seen politicians' families get in trouble before for lobbying their own family members' government. It's not ethical. Mm -hmm. And yet this group is engaging in that kind of activity. Their leader is a person named Justice Donald McLeod. He's a sitting Ontario judge. Mm -hmm. So if part of advocating for black people, let's say, has to do with talking about carding, can a person who is a sitting Ontario judge, who goes to his day job and has people standing in front of him who are in that courtroom because they were carded by the police and arrested, can he advocate against carding when he talks to the government? Of course he can. That's a conflict of interest, and everybody knows that. It's basic. But I've been pointing these things out, and lots of people in my community who think that they've made it, who think that they're not high enough place now that they're satisfied are attacking me. They're saying you shouldn't air the dirty laundry, you shouldn't let, let people advocate in the way that they want to and you advocate in your own way. I didn't know that this piece from the Toronto Star was coming, that was gonna criticize me. The piece said that I personally attacked this sitting Ontario judge but didn't give any examples of how I personally attacked him. I never have, because I don't do my work like that. I had to write an email yesterday morning, or the day before morning, to the Toronto Star, and I'm honestly going to frame it, because 
I had to pitch this piece like I would any other. And the way that I pitched this piece and talking about accountability was to say, you know, Toronto Star, sometimes you sign up for a job and you can't say what you want to say. <laughs> because there are rules. <laughs> and when you sign on, you agree to abide by the rules. So I basically pitched them the ultimatum that Andrew Phillips gave to me that day in the Toronto Star's office. They accepted. <laughs> um, and that was a very proud moment for me because I don't intend to continue writing with the Toronto Star, but to be able to take back that space for one day to make a point, to make a point to the newspaper at the same time as I was making an important argument for my community, that was sweet, sweet, sweet. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take some questions. <clears throat> I'm gonna put some parameters on this. I'm gonna give you one question, one question, and let's get right to that one question, all right? <laughs> Um, that'll help us get a lot more in. So, yes, sir. <coughs> Hello. I have a problem. How you doing? Hey. Um, I wrote for the Toronto Star, and I was fired by the Toronto Star. I had a column in the Toronto Star, but I just wanted to say that uh, there was a young man, just on your seat, who was killed right here in 1953. His name was uh, Garfield Belfort. His brother John Belfont is still alive. I <coughs> called the Toronto Star. This, the story was in the Toronto Star in 1950. He got killed in 1953. I called the Toronto Star. They never got back to me. I called now, they never got back to me. I uh, tried to send it to share. I sent it to the United States. And I just wanted to say that this is a uh, history that took place in this city. Garfield Belfont was killed by the Toronto police before 1979, you know, we talk about the movement starting in 19, 1979, I just want to say that it's black, Canadian, I think he had Bahamian or Bermudian roots. I knew his mother, went to his house. I didn't know him because I didn't, in 1953, I was in Los Angeles, California. But I just wanted to let the record reflect, we need to do some research on Garfield Belfort. Thank you. Thank you. I wrote it down. I'll email it. That's good. <laughs> All right, other questions? I see a hand. Hi. Um, I want to ask a question because earlier on you talked about um, uh, identifying um, the freedom of expression mm -hmm. and, and asking the question of um, who is it that they're defending? Mm -hmm. um, what is your take on, and I know this might be a little dated, um, so, um, on Jordan Peterson is a very interesting uh, individual who uh, represents uh, a very small faction who uh, disagree against uh, a certain pronoun, a neutral pronoun being used to describe transgender folk. Um, and I was on my walk here, I was listening to a podcast in which um, he was interviewed by Russell Brand, and Russell Brand asked him, what is your beef? Uh, and uh, his response was that a lot of folks don't understand that my, my Concern is not about how transgender uh, folks identify, it's about the freedom of expression and how it's government stepping in to um, decide what, what pronouns are used, infringes on the freedom of expression of people being able to express themselves. Mm -hmm. So as a person whose freedom of, of expression has been actually uh, impacted and barred, uh, when a cis white male uh, who, who comes from a position of power tries to address freedom of expression as a way of barring a group of people from self-identifying. What is your take on, on like linguistics being used as a method of um, turning the conversation away from actual issues and actual communities that are being impacted by this erasure? Okay, I'll just briefly repeat the question on the mic so people can hear. Um, but I think the essence of the question is, what do I think about people like Jordan Peterson who are using the notion of freedom of expression to essentially marginalize very specific and vulnerable groups of people? Would that be a fair summation yeah. of the question? Um, first of all, Jordan Peterson is a liar. <laughs> That's the first one, okay? 
So he says that it's not about how people identify. It is. And it is not about pronouns, everybody. It's not about, so let me, let me there's so many things to say about it. Yeah, I know. Um, first of all, if Jordan Peterson can give us an example of when the Canadian government has stopped somebody from talking about pronouns, I'd like to hear it. People get gassed, beaten, hit with nightsticks, punched in the face, dragged by the police. I've watched these things happen. I watched somebody get hit with a gas canister at close range during the G20, somebody walking, a cop walking right up to somebody so that they could shoot them, so that the impact of the canister would hit the person in the chest. That's repression for freedom of speech. What has happened to Jordan Peterson? He's got a Patreon that's given him hundreds of thousands of dollars, and now he goes all around North America and interviews with Russell Brand and gets money. That's his punishment. Come on, man. So he's benefited from what he calls repression, which is very interesting. Um, if a university is a place to debate whether somebody can call themselves how they want to be called, if that's a legitimate debate in a Canadian university in 2018, how safe or unsafe are people who want to go to school who identify that way while they're being talked around and about? But more than that, more than that, if a teacher in class, if a professor in class hears that a, a student is being discriminated against, don't they have a responsibility under the ethical kind of considerations of their job to stop that from happening? But here you have the person who's leading the classroom being the one doing it. This is such a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous situation in a university. But because Jordan Peterson is white and male and cisgender, he can get away with this stuff and his, uh, the, 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 the society that's supposed to be holding him in check and criticizing him calls what he's doing debate. I actually was on a show with Jordan Peterson one time. Uh, Sandy Hudson of Black Lives Matter Toronto was also there. And uh, the rest of the panel were a lot of people who were just kind of in the middle, this is a debate, or they were absolutely supporting Jordan Peterson. All I said when I got the opportunity was that you are putting yourself before your students. Because if it was about your students, when a student says, this is how I like to be called, you'd say, great. But that's too complicated for this selfish man, and he wants to make it about him. This is why I don't talk about Jordan Peterson, why I don't tweet about him, why I don't write about him, because all he wants is to run out the clock. Toni Morrison told us that racism is about wasting our time, and she's right. That's all this man is doing, and he's getting filthy rich. But he should not cross near me when he comes to the street. He should cross the other side, because I have no time for Jordan Peterson or any of the other people who are doing this stuff. So the question is about, um, I mentioned uh, asking people tonight to um, write to the mayor of the city of Toronto and tell him to resign from the police board. And by the way, I wouldn't repeat that request right now. I'm going to say that I'm serious. I actually want you to do this. Because when you don't do it, this is why these things are allowed to continue. And that fear that you feel, I know people, we do organizing and we ask people to call on the phone and they don't want to call because they're actually scared to have to tell a person in a position of authority, or really, you're not talking to John Tory when you call his office, you're talking to his staff. But people are actually afraid to talk to a staff member and be like, as a free citizen, this is my concern. They want to call and they want to say, how can we get along? How can we work together? They don't want to tell the public official who is paid to do the job, 
here's how you do the job. So me asking you to write a letter is really more, I would say, mobilizing than organizing. Organizing requires a lot of things. It requires, first of all, relationships and trust. So if you're going to organize with people in your community, you have to build relationships with them. You can't simply come around an idea together one time and do something and then go away because that's mobilizing. But that's not what we need in the long term. You need to uh, be able to make relationships with people in organizing. And I believe in organizing what you need to do primarily is you need to be able to give the voice and the microphone to somebody who would not otherwise have it if you weren't all organizing as a community. And uh, one of the big problems that we have in Toronto is that a lot of people who could have the capacity to do organizing in their communities would rather not. Because what they would like to do is be like, well, I'm right, I know what I'm doing on this issue, so I'll just say it, I'll just say the thing. And heck, I'm not from the black community, but I'll go and I'll write a piece about the black community and their plight and their struggle. Well, that's not solidarity. That's not, because you don't have to be me, but you have to respect my experience and be there to support me through it. You don't have to do it all yourself. And I think that this is one of the big problems that we have in Toronto organizing. I also just think that people in this city are too rich and comfortable to really do the things that they need to do to support those of us who are not rich and comfortable. I see people complaining about public transit. Your mayor is about to spend, I mean, who knows what the number will be by the time it's actually starting to be built, but this mayor wants to spend $4 billion on one subway stop. Guys, honestly, if I wasn't doing this, what I'm doing, if I had the luxury of not having to fight this uh, white supremacy struggle every day in my life, I'd be organizing to block the damn construction of this uh, $4 billion project. But who's actually gonna do that in Toronto? No, you wanna leave it to OCAP, and you wanna leave it to a couple of radical groups, and you wanna watch them and say, I support you. Supporting people from the sidelines while you watch is not organizing, it's not solidarity. It's nothing. It's not helping. You have to do more. You have to get dirty. You have to put yourself in a situation that may be uncomfortable for you, but that in the end is going to show how much you actually care about that thing. When people camp outside a police station for 16 days and nights in horrible weather because a police officer has killed a black person and not been charged, you can say whatever you want about them except that they don't care. Everybody knew the dedication of Black Lives Matter Toronto if they didn't know it already after that protest. And so, if we want to organize, we should do it where we live, we should do it locally, we should do it with our neighbors, we should do it with the people around us in our community, and we should do it always with a mind of saying, who in our communities needs to get this microphone and how do we give it to them? How do we so show the world that we support them no matter what our different positions or circumstances are? My Twitter name for months now has been here for DeFonte because I am here for DeFonte Miller and every time people see my name, I want them to see his name. That's how we elevate people with the platform that we have. That's just one simple way. And when he was in court last week, I asked people to change their names to hear from DeFonte in solidarity, and a lot of people still kept it. And so now people are like, so what does that mean? Who's that? Who's DeFonte? And then they start Googling, and they start reading, and they start educating themselves. So these things are possible. You want to? Yeah, of course. I'll we'll just give this to you. We're, we're all in this together, right? Yeah. Um, have you ever been told that uh, you're not good enough to be a Canadian or, uh, and also the opposite, that you're ashamed of being a Canadian or have anybody told you like one of the methods to make us feel less than human, less, 
worse than like an animal in uh, any Canadian zoo is more worthy than any of us colored people. Have, it, have anybody told you that uh, the paper is more worthy than actually us, that we are not worthy to be a, a Canadian? Has anybody told you that, uh, not necessarily here in Ontario, maybe in BC or, or Alberta, because they said that uh, Mr. Pierre Trudeau and some of these politicians, they should never have the door open to uh, colored people to, to come into Canada and that we will never we'll, we'll be a Canadian and we're not worthy to be a Canadian. Can you shed some light uh, on, on that? in that issue about who's Canadian and how we ever, uh, you know, about newsflash, I think they should pick up a history book because <laughs> <laughs> last, I know, they forgot that in global, the Global Mail and also in the Upper Canada, uh, was it Upper Canada recordings or something, they used to say half Negro, full Negro, mm -hmm. mixed, available for trade, sales, or something, you know? So I wonder, you know, if they ever pick up a history books from the 17 and 1800s. Thank you. Thank you, good question. Um, my politics around this have really changed in recent years. It's a good question because I have a Canadian passport. I have, again, in theory, only in theory, not in real life, I have the rights of a Canadian citizen. When I go to the border and I try to cross the border, then I know I'm black. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, you're not a Canadian when you're a black person and you cross the border, you're a black person. And that's how you will be treated. Um, so that's a very real thing for me. And because I've gotten so frustrated and tired, I've had to say like, yes, how do I identify? This is not working for me. And the people who have taught me the most are Anishinaabe people. Anishinaabe is a word for many different groups of indigenous peoples, many of whom uh, have traditionally lived in the territories that we're on right now. And so Anishinaabe people have been some of my greatest teachers because a lot of them are around here. I've also learned a lot from Inuit people. I've learned a lot um, from Métis people also, but it's, um, it's a lot of Anishinaabe people who call this part that we call Ontario and Southern Ontario home, who've been my real teachers about this question of what is it that what does it mean to be a Canadian? I can no longer identify really with this term Canadian. I don't I don't want it. I don't want to be a Canadian. Um, I want to be something that would be bigger than being a Canadian. That would be more inclusive, if we can use that word. Because being a Canadian is an exclusive category. The only reason that nation states matter is because they're different. So being a Canadian is just a way of blowing yourself up and saying that you're different and better than people from somewhere else. And you might not think that. You might not want to admit that that's what being a Canadian means, but it does. And this is why we brag about how we go all over the world and do peacekeeping how we export our great ideas and our great culture and our great democracy all over the world because we're expressing superiority through colonial white supremacy. That's what we're doing. That's all we're doing. The British came here and they stole what we now call Canada. I'm not proud to associate with that. I'm also not proud to associate with a country that would give me a passport but then say you're randomly stopped every time you go through security. I don't honor that. I want something bigger than just being a Canadian. I deserve something bigger than that, and I think all of us do. And then when we think about borders, this is where this notion really, really falls apart for me. Because we talk about the Underground Railroad, right? How many people know that thousands of Haitian people have come into the country through a border crossing? One border crossing only. I'm only talking about one. Thousands of Haitian, mostly Haitian migrants have come through a border crossing at Lacan, Quebec. How many of you in this room knew that that's been happening for about the last eight or nine months? Just, a, just okay, more than, this is just so Canadian, everybody's like, oh, the hand. 
you can, you can do this, but um, are those people Canadian? Are they Canadian? We make it seem like as long as you have a certain spirit and a certain desire to succeed, you can be a Canadian. We have a prime minister that says, a Canadian is a Canadian is a can shut up, like Jesus, like, it doesn't mean anything except that we will let you into the club when we want you to, and that we will use the white supremacist colonial rules that we put in place when we stole this country to determine whether or not you're a Canadian. And if we don't think you are, we being the state, then you're not. And I think that we're better than that. I think that all of those black people who are coming here seeking refuge from the most evil regime in my lifetime in the United States, I think that those people belong here. And it has nothing to do with an immigration process or a point system. It has nothing to do with that. It's because they are human beings who need safety and refuge right now. And because we are well positioned to provide it to them. So, I could keep fighting to say that those people should be Canadians, but instead I just want to throw away that notion and create something that would include them just by their being here. And that's a long process, but I think that that process of decolonization that our indigenous friends, the Anishinaabe friends who teach me, that's what that process actually means. It means getting to a point where people can be here and be safe and be taken care of despite whatever label it is that we want. That is a great way to finish. Um, I just want to close by giving you a few reminders. First of all, Desmond has a book coming out <laughs> in November. Double Day is the name of my publisher. I don't have a perspective title for the book yet. I promise you will hear about it. Please buy this book so that I can eat. <laughs> um, so that'll be coming out in November. I'm sure we'll be plugging it at the fold, and I'm already asking Desmond in front of all of you to come to the festival next year so that he feels guilted and whatever. Um, so I'll do a slight plug. My friends, my volunteers would be sad if I didn't plug the Festival of Literary Diversity. Um, so I, I certainly encourage you to attend. Our schedule comes out this Tuesday. So we've been announcing authors for weeks now. Um, we announced Robin Maynard today, who wrote Policing While Black. She'll be at The Fold. And I'll give you a teaser about the session she's at so you feel like you've gotten some extra value. She'll be in conversation with Tanya Talaga, who wrote Seven Fallen Feathers, with moderator Amanda Paris from CBC. So those three powerful women will be in an evening event in downtown Brampton. Um, the Go Bus does go there. I can attest to that. It's very easy. Um, I also want to remind you that Desmond has given you a specific call to action. Um, so if you have honored and respected his presentation, I think that's a really clear thing that you can do to support and uplift him and your city, um, which is to write to Mayor John Tory with your thoughts. Um, and I also want to remind you to sign the position, petition um, which with Penn Canada, it's going to be outside, encouraging you to exit quickly and efficiently to, because uh, the library is closing at 8.30, the doors will lock us all in here. Um, which also reminds you to uh, volunteer to get involved with writing to writers in prison. So uh, those are just some really important calls to action for you to take as you leave. Thank you for being here. Brandon's going to close it all off. Uh, I'd like to begin, obviously, by thanking Desmond and Jill. I think that's a very wonderful <laughs> thing. We will be closed off by a bell and announcement in about two minutes, so I will be very brief. Arthur Ashe once said that the greatest regret in his life was the amount of time he had wasted explaining that black men were no different from other men. I think that says it as moving in as eloquently as it needs to be said. Um, very, very powerful stuff, Dylan. Um, Salman Rushdie also once wrote that every story is a tiny act of censorship because it's a decision not to tell another story. Mm -hmm. I think that goes to the heart of what Penn does. A third thing I would offer without <laughs> explanation is a joke in linguistics. 
that uh, a language is a dialect plus a mommy. I think that condenses a great deal of what we said here tonight. Um, in the spirit of widening the voice, continuing the conversation, I would be remiss if I did not tell you on April the 17th, Marlon James, first Jamaican winner of the Booker Prize. My friend Marlon will be in Toronto in conversation with David Chariandi at the Toronto Public Library. I will be moderating that conversation. I very much hope that you will all come to it. Toronto Public Library, very accessible by public transport. <laughs> <laughs> and our admission is free. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, Was it a photo? <laughs> yeah, I can't tell. Was it a photo? 